Hello and welcome to Mito Action's second Wondering Wednesday, Ask the Genetic Counselor with Genetic Counselor Devin Schumann. My name is Stephanie Harry and I'm an LCHAD parent and one of the patient support coordinators here at Mito Action, and I'll be your host for this evening. We are all very aware of how confusing genetics can be, not only when you're entering into the diagnostic journey, but even years into your diagnosis. The goal of our first two sessions with Devin are to provide a baseline for families to better understand genetics and genetic counseling. Tonight, Devin will help us to better understand genetic testing and guide us in learning how to read our genetic testing reports. Although this session will have more of a presentation format with question and answer time at the end, starting March, our format will change a bit. The sessions will be a bit more informal and focused on questions brought to the meetings by attendees. To protect the privacy of families and their questions, starting in March, our sessions will no longer be recorded. Rather, we will post brief summaries of these sessions on our website, so knowledge can still be gleaned if you miss that time. I want to note that this space is a little different than our traditional expert series if you've attended those. We set this call up as a Zoom meeting, which means that you have both video and audio access. Please take this time to make sure that you're muted and that your video is either on or off, depending on what your preference is. It's very important that you keep your audio off while you are not speaking. This will give everyone a more pleasurable experience. If you have questions during Devin's presentation, feel free to put them in the chat and Devin can tend to them after the presentation. If you'd like to ask your own question after the presentation, please raise your virtual hand and or unmute yourself and you can ask Devin your questions personally. That's absolutely fine. As previously stated, today's discussion will be recorded and available on the Mito Action website in the coming days, as well as on our podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. So without further ado, let me officially introduce genetic counselor, Devin Schumann. Devin Schumann has a master's degree in genetic counseling from UC Irvine in California and currently works as a telehealth genetic counselor at the nonprofit Genetic Support Foundation. She's previously worked at an autism and developmental medicine center and a high-risk pre pregnancy center. Outside of work, Devin runs teenage and young adult focused mitochondrial disease community supports, including two Facebook groups and a weekly Zoom support call for teens, complete with virtual proms, holiday events, and round tables with physicians. Recent projects have included a mitochondrial DNA TED Ed video and giving lectures to genetic counseling graduate programs about mitochondrial disease. And if you joined us last time, you know what a treat it is. Devin is an amazing speaker, and I'm so excited for her to share again tonight. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it off. Hello. Okay, so I am going to share my screen so you guys can see some slides. I always say I'm pretty informal, though, so put any questions you have in the chat. I tend to multitask things a little too well, maybe, but I can't help it. So if anything pops up, if you guys can't hear me, something changes with audio, just always let me know. Do not hesitate to do so. But last time we talked, it was more of a genetics 101. Like, what is a gene? How is mitochondrial disease inherited? This time, I'm trying to focus a little bit more on the things that come up during the genetic testing process. Now, Again, if you were here before, you've met me. If not, my name's Devin. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a genetic counselor, but I also have mitochondrial disease. And I say I always approach this with all my hats on. I don't think we can put our lives into little neat boxes that are separate from each other. My brother has mito, so I was first a family member, then I was diagnosed, and then I became a genetic counselor. So all aspects are at play at all times. I don't think you can separate those parts of me out. Quick disclaimer about genetics. Everything has an exception to the rule. I jokingly say over and over again, I never say never in genetics. There's pretty much not a slide on here where I can't think of some exception to the rule, but I'm trying to get the basics. So if you're like, hey, that doesn't line up with what my family did, pop it in a question. I, it's a perfect example that I can talk about how that's a little bit different than what we might typically see or might just be the 101 summary. Last time I gave people the framework of thinking of genes as books. I wanted to just really quickly go over that metaphor again to kind of reground that in our brain because it really helps to understand what are the different types of testing that we can do that are out there. DNA or our genes are written out in letters just like a book is. That's part of what makes the book metaphor work so well. You can think of genes as like recipes or instruction manuals for your body. If you remember high school biology class with the chromosome pictures, you can think of those as the cookbooks. 
because we have 23 pairs of these cookbooks, typically you get one chromosome from each pair from mom and one from dad. So for most genes in your body, though not all, you have two copies of the gene. I'm saying this again because it's helpful when we get down to some of the different testing. Now, mitochondrial DNA is a little bit different. So the chromosome DNA, we call nuclear DNA. Mitochondrial DNA are actually little loops of genes. So don't think of it so much as a book as a little loop of all of these instructions taped together. And this can be a little bit more confusing too, because instead of having just two copies of every gene in our body, we have little loops of 37 genes in every mitochondria and every cell has multiple mitochondria. So when you multiply that by all the cells in our body, you have millions of copies of these little loops of DNA, which again is important when we start to talk about variants in this DNA and how we read those test results. The book metaphor works really well because you can think of mutations or variants as just spelling changes. These can be new changes, ones that pop up in someone for the first time when they're born, or you can think of them as recipes you inherit from your family, right? Like my mom's family all makes cookies in that family. There are different types of spelling changes, and so it works really well to describe the differences when we think about it this way. One important clarification that I brought up in the first talk is the fact that while mitochondrial disease may seem like it'd be from mitochondrial DNA, it's actually not quite that straightforward. With families where we find a genetic answer for their mito, 80% of the time it's actually in that nuclear DNA you get from both your parents and not just the mitochondrial DNA that you think of as a maternally inherited because you get it in the egg cell when you develop. A lot of doctors have missed this memo too. So it's part of why I like to include it every time I talk about mito because it's a really important detail when you're trying to figure out how do we do testing or how do we interpret results. Now, another important disclaimer, you might have noticed I said, for those who find a genetic answer, 80% of the time it's a nuclear change. For a lot of families, we're not gonna find a genetic answer. In about 20 to 40% of people with a clinical diagnosis of mito, based on current knowledge and technology, we'll be able to find them. Here's the genetic reason that you have your symptoms. But for the rest of people, we haven't quite got there yet. It's not that it's not genetic. It could just be that we don't have the technology or knowledge to find them their answers yet. And so this leads to my next important disclaimer. Genetic testing can diagnose you with mito or help rule it in as your answer, but a negative genetic test alone cannot rule it out. So I can't say, well, your test was negative, so you obviously don't have mito. That's not quite how that works. Again, some providers don't quite understand the nuances that are there because they say, well, it says negative, so that probably means you're good to go. Another important disclaimer is you can have mitochondrial dysfunction. So that can show up on like a muscle biopsy or a buccal swab. And that doesn't always mean that you have a mitochondrial gene that's causing those dysfunction. It could be aging. It could be infections. It could be environmental factors like medications. It can also be other genetic syndromes. There are other ones that we know are not technically a form of mito, but we test patients with that other syndrome. We notice their mitochondria is not working as well as it should. So it can be a secondary finding to other things. And that also partly explains why not everyone who gets labeled as having mito may end up always finding a genetic answer for their symptoms that falls under the mito umbrella. Genetic testing is not the end all when it comes to everything. It's what I focus on a lot because I'm a genetic counselor, but I like to add that catch all of, you don't always have to do it. Genetic testing is helpful for a lot of people, but not everyone wants to do it and not everyone finds it helpful. So even though I'm focusing on it a lot, I just want to give a little shout out that Sometimes it's not the right decision for your family or for you at this time in your life. And that is totally fine. That's a perfect answer to say thanks, but no thanks when someone offers you a test like genetic testing. Now, I talked about genetic changes. It's like running spell check on your genes. There's a lot of different ways that we can run spell check. So I wanna just mention a couple of the different ways we can do it. So if you see these terms, you see it in the name of a test or on a report, you have an idea of kind of, hey, this sounds vaguely familiar. This is what they were doing. 
Not all genetic testing are created equal. They're not all the same to each other. And labs can be a little tricky sometimes in how they phrase it. They might call it sequencing, but when you read the message, you're like, I don't actually think that's really what you're doing. And so you have to be careful. And that's part of why it is ideal that we don't live in an ideal world to try to involve someone with genetics experience in ordering these tests, because it's easy to pick one because the name sounds good, but not realize how it could be very different from another option that's out there. Now, sequencing and genotyping are kind of the two basic ways that we talk about reading a gene. You can think of sequencing as looking at every letter within a gene. So that is like taking a book and reading it the way that we read a book, right? Letter by letter, sentence by sentence, going through it. This is the mo most comprehensive way to run spell check on a gene. We're taking it letter by letter and seeing what pops up. Genotyping, it's still out there, though it's kind of the more old school way to do it. You can think of that as like a spelling bee. You have a list of common spelling changes and we're looking for them one by one. So this is essentially saying, okay, well, we know this change is common. Let's see if you have it. You don't, you're good. It's very limited, but it can reduce the chance that you carry a condition. It can't rule it out completely. The most precise you can get with that is actually looking for a familial variant, right? So if you know that your brother or your mom carries a change in a gene, sometimes we start by just testing for that one change that's called familial variant testing. That's a form of genotyping. We're looking for just the one thing that we know you're at the highest risk of carrying. An example of this is if you take that sentence that I had on the last page and you add 10 spelling mistakes to it, sequencing would pick up all 10. You would say, oh, look, we're missing a K. There's an O where we should have an I. There's an A where we should have an O. You'll notice all of them because you're going letter by letter. But genotyping, well, maybe we just know I'm really bad at typing long words. So we say, okay, these are the three most common mistakes Devin is gonna make when she writes this sentence. So we can take the same sentence that has, we know 10 different changes in it, but with genotyping, we might only say you have three changes because we're just looking for the three that are listed above. So if those three words were perfect, we'd say you're good to go and we'd miss the other seven changes. So it's helpful, but it's not the end all. And you do see this still at a lot of labs. And so you do have to be aware if you had this test, you could have a false negative. We say we didn't find a change, but maybe we just missed it. When you do something called copy number testing, that's a term again you might see on a lab, you can think of that as just looking for deletions or duplications. You're testing how many copies of a gene that you have. This is something we do on mitochondrial DNA, which is the loop I included on the screen. It's also something we do in our nuclear DNA. A good example of this is there's a really common deletion that extends this much of the loop that can cause CPEO or KSS, that spectrum. So when people are testing for that, they're doing copy number analysis, looking to see, hey, do we see that little section deleted? For nuclear DNA, we usually have two copies of every gene, right? One from mom, one from dad. So if we see that you have two copies, we'd say you've got the normal number. But if we count three copies of a gene, you have a duplication. If we count only one copy, you have a deletion. It's not running spell check on the gene. It's not saying what is in that copy. It's simply saying you've got an entire extra one. The most common example of this is Down syndrome. That's an entire extra 21st chromosome. That's a duplication. This is helpful because sometimes labs will only run spell check and they won't realize that you're missing an entire copy because they didn't see any spelling changes in it. So they said you look good, but they don't realize you were missing one of the two. And so it's important for labs to do both when we're looking for genetic answers. SNP analysis, I honestly hesitated almost including it, but it pops up a lot, a lot online. So I think it's important for people to know what it is. We call it SNP for short. The long name is single nucleotide polymorphism, which sounds confusing, but single just means a single letter. Nucleotide is a genetic term for letter. It's also called a base pair. And polymorphism just means normal variant. So this is looking for single letter normal variants that are seen in the general population. 
when we do this test, it's not actually running spell check on your genes, right? We're not reading them letter by letter or genotyping, looking for common mutations. We're saying, hey, we see that you have a common variant and that common variant tends to go with mutations. So you might have those mutations. Think of that as you're looking at a textbook, right? And there's sticky notes in it. And you're like, hey, I see you have the blue sticky note. That means that we usually have the normal version of that gene. So you're probably good. Not actually opening the book, but it's saying we see the blue, you're probably good. But if we see the yellow sticky note, I'll be like, hey, that's version B. That often has this certain mutation in it. So you probably have that mutation. If these normal variants are close enough to problems that recur, so mutations that can happen in multiple people, they can try to guess and say, well, we see a normal variant that's often paired with that mutation that causes a problem. So you might also have that mutation. Essentially, they're guessing what version of a gene that you have or what variants you have in a gene based on normal variation that we all carry. Part of why I mentioned this is this is what 23andMe does and a lot of those online labs. So when they tell you, hey, you have a variant, often they're saying, hey, we're guessing you have a variant. And that's part of why if you bring those results to a doctor, sometimes they just look at you and they're like, we can't use this, but they don't always explain why. And it's because the lab wasn't doing an actual spell check. It was guessing at what you have and that's cheaper to do. And so that's part of why they do it through a lot of that direct to consumer testing. It can get confusing, but you have to kind of think of it as it's a best guess of what your genes look like. It's not running spell check on them. And so again, if they say everything looks good, it's probably it could be a false negative. Or if they say they see something, some of the old studies of 23andMe found a 40% false positive rate for what they reported out. They were guessing and they were right just slightly less than half of the time. So again, not as helpful at the end of the day. They're improving since then, but it's why we kind of take them with a grain of salt in the genetics world. So what did I go over basically so far? Sequencing is running spell check on a gene letter by letter. Genotyping is looking for common spelling changes that we see occurring in multiple people. Single site testing is familial variant testing, looking for one change we've seen in a family member. Copy number analysis is seeing how many copies of a gene you have, deletions or duplications. SNP analysis is looking at normal variants and guessing what you have in your genetic code based off of those. Again, it can be helpful, it can be fun, but you gotta know what you're signing up for and paying for. But what do these actually look like on a testing level, right? Like your doctor doesn't usually say, I ordered SNP analysis. They say, I ordered a panel, or they said, I ordered whole exome. So you have to know, okay, what do these actually mean? There's a pretty big funnel, right? At the bottom, you have everything that's really precise. That's looking for just what's in your family. The top end of the funnel, you have whole genome sequencing, right? It's covering a bunch of the different genes. I'll go into details on all, but I will also say I've left some things off the funnel. I tried to focus on ones that are conditions or tests you would have done because you have mito. It's not gonna talk about things you might do if you have autism. There's some different conditions that we don't look for on this, like Down syndrome, you can't pick up based on these tests I've listed. But I tried to focus it so you're not learning everything that exists out there. Starting with the most precise, the one I already mentioned, familial variant testing. You kind of get a, ye a yes or a no answer. You either carry the variant your family member has or you don't, yes or no. It's not gonna find any other things. They're not looking at all these other genes. And I will say one thing I find really helpful for this is ideally, if you're going to do this kind of testing, you want a copy of your family member's test result. And in an ideal world, you want to go to the same lab that they did. And why I say that is because that lab, they've proven that they can find that variant. Let's say you have a rare one. They haven't seen it before. If another lab does it, they don't have what we call a positive control. If they don't see it, they think they looked for it well, but I don't have proof that they can find it. We do want to trust them, but I always say trust but verify. So in an ideal world, if we can do it at the same lab, we might as well. This is also why I give patients copies of every test I order on them, and I jokingly say, hand it out at family dinner, right? Like if you don't give that result to other people, then when they go talk to their doctor, it becomes a game of telephone. 
right? Like I hope that I'm passing along the key details that matter. If they have a copy, it's a lot of personal info. I didn't get that, but it makes it so that if they then do testing, it's more likely that it's done correctly. And there's a lot of tests out there. So you can't just assume the next doctor will know exactly how to order the same test that found an answer for someone else in your family. Mitochondrial DNA testing is a very focused test. You can think of that as almost like a panel. It's looking at the 37 genes that are in the mitochondrial DNA loop. One clue that your gene is in that loop is it's often written out with an MT dash and then it has the name of the gene. So MT dash ND1, MT dash ND2, that's telling you it's a mitochondrial DNA change. And with these, typically, they will do sequencing of it or genotyping. So looking at common variants or looking at all of the variants. And they will often do deletion and duplication testing as well. Again, because we know there are some recurrent deletions that we see in multiple people that can explain mito for them. This image just happens to have some of the most common deletions or mutations that you see in it. You don't have to memorize those. This can get a little bit more complicated though, because like I said, we've got millions of copies of mitochondrial DNA in our body. So when we do this test, you'll often see on the report the word heteroplasmy, which means out of the mitochondrial DNA they looked at, what percentage carried that change? Was it in 1% of the DNA we tested or 99% of the DNA we tested? An important caveat from the last presentation, that percentage can vary by sample. Your blood sample could be different than your muscle biopsy. So that is sometimes why doctors will have you do follow-up testing and will say, hey, I really wanna get a different type of sample on you to try to check what is that percentage in different parts of your body. For mitochondrial DNA, that percentage will vary from 0% to 100%. In comparison, for nuclear DNA, right, you've got two copies of the gene. So if you have a mutation, typically it's in 50%, or 100%, you tend to have a concrete answer because it's like flipping a coin if you have the change passed down or not, 50-50. From mitochondrial DNA, it's a little bit less straightforward. Anywhere between zero and 100 can pop up. Now, panel testing, it can include mitochondrial DNA, but often it also includes the nuclear DNA. Now, a panel test, all that means is they've made a list of genes that are typically associated with a syndrome or a symptom. So you might have a mitochondrial disease panel. You might also have a panel for hearing loss. Every lab is gonna design that panel a little bit differently. So you could have two mitochondrial disease panels. Sometimes even at the same lab, they'll have different versions that dramatically differ from each other. One lab might look at 100 genes, another might look at 900 genes. These panels can be sequencing, looking at every letter, or they can be genotyping. So again, even the same panel at the same lab, if it has a slightly different name, you wanna figure out why and figure out what are they doing differently between the two. Typically, they do look for deletions or duplications when they do these. Now, I will say that wall panels some people are like, well, why would we do them? They're so limited. It only looks at 100 genes or 900. They are limited, but they're designed to only look at those genes. So in genetics, we talk about something called coverage, which means how well do we cover looking at that gene? Can we detect all different types of changes in that gene? Can we detect different changes at every point in that gene? Sometimes there's parts of genes that are really hard to read. And so because of that, the lab has to do something special to look at that region. And so on a panel, you know that they have tried their hardest to look at every region of every gene on that panel. You know that they're taking those extra steps to make sure we actually dig in deep to all of those genes and we know what we're looking at. They also tend to be a lot cheaper. They also tend to be more approved by insurance. Insurance doesn't love when we go on fishing expeditions and we throw a giant net and we see what we catch. So often they'll try to make you do panels first. And again, it doesn't always have to be a bad thing. Sometimes those panels are better at making sure that if it says negative, we've truly ruled out all changes in the genes included. So I still order them sometimes, even in the days of whole exome and whole genome, which I'm gonna jump to next. For both of those tests though, 
I will say, this is again for a comparison for the next one, it doesn't always matter what your doctor tells the lab, right? If you're doing the hearing loss panel, I mean, hopefully you have hearing loss so we're not just doing it on a random person, but if you say I have hearing loss and kidney issues, they're still gonna look at the 100 genes on the hearing loss panel. They're not gonna do anything differently typically based on what you tell them about you. So it's more of just making sure you pick the right panel. By that same logic, they're not gonna tell you every change they see in the gene typically. If a change is what we consider normal variation, most labs aren't gonna tell you that, though some do. If you've had mitochondrial DNA testing, you might've seen a long list at the end called benign variants. Some labs like to say, well, here's everything we saw just in case you need it later. They also might not report out changes that they don't think are gonna cause symptoms for you. So like I said, autosomal recessive genes, we have two copies of them and they both have to not work before you show symptoms. They only see one change. Some labs don't report that out because they're like, that just makes you a carrier. It shouldn't cause your symptoms. So we don't think it's relevant. You have to know the lab that you're using to make sure that you're getting the info that you want. Everyone's doctors might want something slightly differently. So not every panel will be the right choice for everyone in the mito community. Whole exome is kind of the next step. It's the big net you throw. So it's also called WES or WES testing. This is sequencing. So whole exome sequencing, it's in the name. And it tries to look at all of the genes in your body that give instructions on how to make proteins. We call those exons. So exome for exons. So if you look at the picture, right? We cut out only these dark blue spots. These are what tell your body how to make the pieces of the protein that then you use. So whole exome is just looking at those. We used to think that what was in between these introns, they honestly, in some textbooks, used to call it trash DNA or the throwout DNA. It's the filler. We didn't think it mattered, so we didn't used to look at it. So we just focused on the exons. But as we learn more, that's not totally true. And it's part of why we've moved on to whole genome, which I'll get to in a sec. But on average, even if we're looking at all the genes, only about one to 2% of all the DNA in our body is actually in these exons. So while it's a pretty good test, it is not looking at every single piece of your DNA. And so there are limitations to it. Whole genome is trying to look at the exons and the introns. It's trying to look at all of your DNA. And why do we think that this could be helpful for some families? Because those introns, they actually help your body regulate your genes. It'll tell you, hey, this is why we use this protein. Hey, this is where you cut, this is where you cut me out of the equation. It tells you where those points are to put the pieces together. It tells your body sometimes to use that gene more or to use it less in different parts of our body. So changes in those can actually have an impact on how our body functions. So that's part of where we're starting to move in the direction of whole genome sequencing. Again, sequencing, it's in the name. This is the newest and shiniest test, but I will say it is still limited. So when we do any of these genetic tests, even if we say we quote unquote, look at everything, we're limited by our own knowledge. We're limited by our own current technology. And for these two tests, we're limited by the symptoms that your doctor tells the lab that you have. The other limitation of these is because they're trying to cover everything, they have to make compromises. And so in doing so, might not have the same coverage, ability to look at every part of every gene in the same way. And so in trying to look at 20,000 different genes, there's a chance that they're not doing as good of a job at looking at the 900 we think cause mito. And so you have to balance everything when you pick these tests. So I say as a rule of thumb, the bigger the test you do, the more genes are included and the more data that you get, but the less likely that you're gonna be confident that each gene was looked at carefully, right? If I'm looking for the one mutation your brother has, I'm confident we're looking for it. But if I'm trying to look at 20,000 different genes, if you have a familial variant, it might not get detected depending on how the lab runs the test. So that's why it's helpful to have family's test results to make sure whatever you're ordering is covering what we're suspecting. Now, for both of these tests, part of why I say your symptoms matter is because yes, they do run spell check all the genes in your body. 
but we can't just report that out. We would be giving everyone a literal dictionary filled with variants. So they have to sort it. And how they sort that is typically by the symptoms your doctor reports to them. So for example, if I say that you have muscle weakness and seizures, they're gonna take the pile of genes having to do with the muscles and the pile of genes that are associated with seizures and look through those two boxes. If you have hearing loss only, we're not gonna find a seizure gene unless it's a condition that causes hearing loss and seizures. So you have to know what you're looking for. What symptoms are reported is crucial to how helpful these tests are. This is one of those where I like to just print off the patient's clinic note and send it with the sample and let them read through all of it and write down all of the symptoms humanly possible. It does mean I got a lot of reports to explain why my patient has eczema, which was not quite what I was looking for, but that still tells me, hey, they're covering their bases, which is what I want. So when you run one of these tests on the same person, you can get different results if it's done at a different time, because we learn more over time, if it's run by a different lab, because they all sort things differently, and if we give different medical histories to those labs. One lab might say, hey, I think there are 900 genes associated with seizures. Another might say there's 1,000 you might get a different answer, even though your DNA is the same, because it has to do with how they're sorting through it. They also might interpret variants differently. Some of them will be like, oh, I've seen that 50 times. I know it's not a problem, but another lab might be like, I've never seen it before, so I'm telling you about it because I don't know what it means. They do vary between them, and that's part of why you got to be cautious or conscientious of what you order, who's ordering it. So we're trying to get the most out of what we're doing for patients. For these two tests, labs will often ask for parental samples. And this is not per se because they're gonna test the parents for everything they're looking for in the kid or in the adult, but because we're trying to help analyze these variants. So if, for example, if I'm doing a test because someone has hearing loss, and I find a change in a gene that can cause hearing loss, but it's a change we've never seen before. So I don't know if it's helpful, if it's our answer, or if it's just a coincidence. Well, if I have a sample from that person's mother and she doesn't have hearing loss, but she does have the change, well, that makes it less likely that it's causing the hearing loss in the patient. That's a helpful clue. Now, this can get confusing for families because they'll be like, we all gave samples. And so if a mom, and her son both have mito symptoms, she might be like, oh, well, his was negative. I gave my sample, so mine is negative. No, they did not run the whole test on you. They use you as helpful data. Unless you order it in a special way, they're not actually running the whole test on you. So if the mom has a variant that her son does not, they're not gonna tell you because they're not testing her. And that's, again, a common misconception that people will not realize hey, maybe we do wanna do it on both different people in the family because there could be two different things going on. I've seen it happen. For these labs, another good thing to know is they often offer a free reanalysis of your data. They know that we're always learning more. So if you do the test now and in two years, let's say we didn't find an answer the first time, a lot of these labs will let you rerun it for free. They'll give you a new report. My personal preference is that you ask for that new report either A, when new symptoms develop, right? Because if you didn't have hearing loss before and now you do, that's a whole new box of genes we get to look through. Or with time, if you wait a year or two, we're gonna discover new genes that are associated with your symptoms. For example, one mito doc I was chatting with once said, she's pretty sure there's at least a new mito gene every month that's discovered. So if you wait a year, that's 12 new genes, right? And so not only do we know more about the genes, and not only are we better at testing them, but also now maybe there's more ones to look at. So maybe your negative was just limited by what we knew at the time. And so getting a free reanalysis can be a really helpful step, but also don't do it like two months later because you're not gonna really get anything new for it. You wanna give it time to make it helpful. One thing you'll see on these that I also I debated including, but I think it's good for people to realize they need to think about this before they say yes to one of these big tests, there's something called secondary or incidental findings. This means genetic results that are not related to the reason we're doing the test. Now that can happen with any genetic test. I joke, it's like a Pandora's box. You never know what you find inside when you order one. But there's actually a list of genes from the American College of Medical Genetics 
that they decided if you're doing whole exome or whole, whole genome, you should have the option to opt in or out of getting these results because these are relatively common, serious, but actionable, treatable conditions like breast cancer syndromes, sudden cardiac death syndromes. They're ones that if you carry a change, we're gonna recommend different monitoring for you and different treatments. And you might not have symptoms until you develop something like cancer, right? So there's not always a warning sign for these. You can sometimes see them in family history, but not always. And so they will often say, do you wanna opt in or opt out of these? And again, if you do like a sample on your kid and you include both parents, you kind of all go along for the ride at most labs. So you have to decide as a unit, do we want this information or not? And honestly, a lot of patients never even realized this was on the table. And they so they feel kind of shocked when this is offered. They're like, I thought I was trying to figure out why my kid has mito. Why are you talking to me about cancer? So I mentioned it now. So it sounds vaguely familiar if you ever do this in the future. And so maybe you've thought through, do I want this info? Because honestly, not everybody does. Not everyone wants to know if maybe I could develop cancer later on in life. So it's, it's good to know what you're signing up for. Big differences between these tests, quick little table. They take different amounts of time. A familial variant testing is a lot faster, a couple weeks to come back. A panel tends to take three to six weeks. Whole exome or whole genome really can vary. <laughs> um, some labs magically get it back to you in a month. Most will say it's a two to three month turnaround. Some take longer, it's four to six months. It depends on their workflow and how they do things. Cash pay prices are what I included on this table because you can't make a table of insurance prices. I'm gonna be honest. If you take even Blue Cross Blue Shield, you look at 20 different plans under that umbrella, you're gonna get 20 different prices for some of these tests. But cash pay, familial variant testing, some labs do it for free. If a family member had a change, it's free to test other people. For others, it's a, it's a $99 follow-up test or it's $200 only, depends on the lab. For panels, it can be more expensive with insurance, to be honest, but a lot of labs have a cash pay 250 option where it's 250 for a panel. Doesn't matter if it's cancer, cardio, or mito, a lot of them have that cash pay base rate. Whole exome and whole genome tends to get pretty pricey. We're talking thousands of dollars. These are all assuming you don't qualify for financial aid because then that's a whole different ballpark. Honestly, sometimes you end up paying a lot more than what's on this table, depending on your insurance. If you have a $5,000 deductible, a lot of these labs bill the insurance more than what they cash pay bill because they only get a percentage back. So they're gonna bill your insurance 20,000 for an exome, hoping to get 1,000 back. So if you have a $5,000 deductible, you might be looking at a pretty penny bill. So a lot of these companies will give you a cost estimate if you look into it and ask them, or at least when they get the sample, you can hold for that. So I always say it's good to try to figure that out because genetic testing on average will cost you at least a couple hundred dollars. And so it's good to know that walking into it, assuming that you don't have Medicaid or don't qualify for free testing for one reason or another. I will say though, it's not just about the money, right? Like I really want people to think through, do they want this test? How do they feel about uncertainty? The bigger the test, the more likely you'll get a bunch of stuff we don't know the meaning of. How do you feel about learning info you're not searching for, right? A more targeted test is less likely to throw a curveball at you. I'm not even touching on it here, but you can get discriminated against for life insurance and long-term disability for having a genetic variant. So sometimes people decide to go get that set up ahead of time before they do testing. Just depends on where you are at what stage in your life and how much it's going to impact your day-to-day. -day. And do you just need this answer or do you want to wait a month or two and circle back to this later? There's a whole bunch of different tests here. Again, I won't just make everyone read these, but I include them for the summaries. When you look at it later, you can pause and go, here's a brief cutout of everything we just went over. Interpreting variants, I think it's important to kind of know how doctors and labs do this because I think it leads to a lot of confusion for families. And so not that I expect you to walk away knowing how to interpret a variant, but I still think it's helpful to kind of know where we're coming from. So, right, like the first thing I do when I see a change in a gene on a report is I go, okay, well, what do I know about the gene? Is this a gene where having one change is enough to cause symptoms or do you need two? Is this a mitochondrial DNA change where I next have to look at the percentage it's in? That's the first place I start because even if the symptoms seem to match, but you only have one change and you really need two for that gene, 
maybe we're missing the second variant, but more likely it's not your answer. And so I want to start there and kind of work my way back from, are we even in a position where this could cause problems? So I usually say, what do we know about the gene? And then I go, what do we know about the variant? Have we seen it before in people with symptoms or in healthy control populations? Is this variant in a very crucial part of the gene? Is it in the sentence that says, put the cookies in the oven so you end up with just raw cookie dough? Or is it in the sentence that's adding ingredients and it's just an extra cup of chocolate chips or sugar where maybe it makes a difference, but I don't know just by looking at it. I also look at how big is the change in the gene? Do you have a single letter that's changed? We call those missense variants. Or do you have where like half the genes deleted or not working? We call those nonsense variants because everything after the change is nonsense. My favorite name for that. And so you need to know, okay, what is this change like? Because not all changes are created equal, just like not all spelling changes are gonna totally disrupt a recipe. They put them on a continuum. Pathogenic means it's known to disrupt the gene function and could cause symptoms. Benign means we think it's just normal variation. If we're not 100% sure, we'll try to categorize it as likely one or likely the other. But a lot gets stuck in the middle, what we call a VUS. Some people call that a VUS, variance of uncertain significance. We don't have enough info to classify it as one or the other. I will say that from a giant counseling point of view, I use a very complicated table, table and tally up points and try to make it figure out where everything falls. I'm not going to make anyone walk through that. To give you a concept for kind of how do we think about it, right? It's more likely to be normal variation if we see it in 5% of healthy control populations. It's more likely to be normal variation if it's inherited from a par parent that doesn't have any symptoms, or it's at the same location as another variant that doesn't cause any symptoms, right? It's more likely to be pathogenic or maybe be your answer if it's a new change, if it's been seen in other people with symptoms. If we predict it to be in a really crucial part of the gene, or if we don't see it in healthy controls, right? If it's not occurring anywhere in the population, well, then maybe it's not occurring because it's going to cause a problem. And so that's why we're not seeing it over and over again. So doctors try to tally all of this up and get points at the end to say, where do you fall on? I will say that for variants of uncertain significance, the US's, it is really tempting when you see one to think that that's your answer. Because right, we're only looking at genes that we think match your symptoms. If I'm doing a mitochondrial disease panel and I find three VUSs in mitochondrial genes, even doctors fall for the trap of, well, it fits, so it must be it. You have to remember, even on whole exome and whole genome, we're focusing on what matches your symptoms. So at the end of the day, it's going to be really tempting, but you have to try not to fall into that trap. It really could be that we're missing it. And I don't want to stop looking for you, right? Your answer could still be out there. And maybe everyone stops looking because they're like, this is probably it. I want to make sure that we're really covering our bases. In terms of VUSs, if we really looked at every one in every gene, we'd be giving people thousands of variants. And that's part of why tests like whole exome are sorted by your symptoms. Because it's also just not practical to give people, here's a thousand variants. Good luck, figure it out. But that doesn't help anyone. Typically, we don't recommend changing medical treatment based off of a VUS, because on average, if we look at big studies, most of them get reclassified as normal variation instead of getting reclassified as pathogenic. So as we learn more, most often, we learn that things aren't a problem. Not always, so that's why we, it's still an important category, but we do try to reassess it as we learn more. So sometimes you need to check in every couple of years to say, hey, have we seen this in 20 more people? What do we know about it now? In my opinion, VUSs are very helpful because they make your document something that you can carry forwards, right? If your tests have five question marks, that's five things you can follow up on and see what we learn more. If it's just a negative, that's only so helpful. It's still helpful, but it doesn't give you anything to work on. But it's also important to realize that these can be really stressful, right? If your kid comes in, let's say with just developmental delays and we do a test and we find a change in a gene that can cause seizures, maybe we weren't worried about seizures before, but now it's really hard not to be worried about seizures. Even if they say, I don't think this is going to cause symptoms or we're not going to do anything differently. We're not going to start testing for seizures every month. Well, once you hear that word, it's really hard not to go down the wormhole of worrying about it 
And also other doctors sometimes go down the wormhole. I've seen patients have surgeries based off the US's trying to confirm them or rule them in or out. And that can also be really not great either. So you have to kind of know how do I feel about it? How can I balance out uncertainty before you do giant panels from labs that love to report lots of these? Again, for some people, they're very helpful though. So I don't think they have their place. And sometimes there will be easy ways to follow up on it. Sometimes we know that gene causes high iron. If your iron's normal, probably not our answer, but it's not usually that clear cut. And that's part of why following up with specialists or geneticists can be really, really helpful. Any test will say on it needs clinical correlation, which means somebody who knows the patient and knows these conditions needs to put the two next to each other and make sure they match up or figure out how they don't. Like you need to figure out are we missing a second change? Is this all of your answer? You need someone who can do that. It can take a while to get in with people, but that tends to be why I'm like, put yourself on the waiting list because you never know what you're gonna need in a year if that's how long their waiting list is. You can always follow up them when, when you get there or follow up if you get a test result from someone else. It's good to have someone lined up to help you go through those results. Why I always think about VUSs so much is honestly, one of my first experiences at a mito picnic was talking to a family that said, I don't actually know how that's happening. I'm um, talking to a family who said, hey, I know why I'm so messed up. Did you see this report I got from my geneticist? And they had the whole list of all the variants and it was like a page long. They're like, I have 10 things wrong with me. No wonder I'm so messed up. And I will never forget that conversation because I also wasn't fair to that person. Walking around being like, I have 10 things wrong with me. No wonder everything's going to heck. That's not fair to them. That's not fair to put that onto someone. It's not that you have 10 different things wrong with you, quote unquote. It's not that anything has to do with being wrong with you. But when people don't walk you through results or where they just say, hey, it was negative and send you home. And then you look at home and you're like, what do you mean negative? There's 10 things here. It can lead to a lot of mistrust and a lot of anxiety. To me, what a long list of variants of uncertain significance mean is honestly nothing about you. It's about the lab. That's telling me, oh, you used a lab that likes to report those out. Some labs love to do it and some almost never do it. So it's more about the lab than it is about the person. And so you need to know that and try not to take it to heart if you can avoid it. Quick summary of all of that again, so you can go back and read it later um, in terms of other stuff. I do include an example on just how to read reports just to kind of quickly walk people through like what are some of the examples so when you see yours you'll get that, right? Whole exome sequencing, Gene DS calls it exome DX. You're looking for the term up here. What info did the lab have? Pretty much every test will have some sentence that says clinical indication. That's important, right? Because if this is your kid's report and your kid also has hearing loss and vision loss and kidney issues. You're like, wait, hold on, those weren't listed. Maybe I need to talk to them about reanalyzing this result to include everything that we need to look for. So it's important to start with those two. So what does this mean? They read your genes letter by letter and they focused on genes that have to do with unique facial features, seizures, and intellectual disabilities on this report. Those are the buckets that they looked in. Next thing, as I say, well, what did you see? First, no causative variants were identified. That's telling me we didn't find a pathogenic slam dunk answer, but there were possible answers, variants of uncertain significance. What all of this nonsense means below, first is just the gene name. Some of them you say them, so like GRIN2B, you don't say G-R-I-N-2B, but for most of them, it's just the letters. It's gonna be VRPF1. They all sound like gibberish. We fully acknowledge that in genetics. For the disease itself, this is leading to confusion for a lot of people because it doesn't always match between results or what you see online. We've gone away from testing conditions and then calling them by the doctor that first discovered them. We've figured out that often, one syndrome could actually have 20 different genes that all cause similar symptoms or the opposite. One gene can cause five different syndromes. So we're trying to rename everything as gene name equals related disorders. It doesn't sound as fun, but it does make it a little bit more practical when we're talking to families. It does help with just understanding how it all works and correlating different families to each other. 
both of these changes were autosomal dominant, right? Which means you have two copies of the gene and only one mutation is needed before you show symptoms. So if these mutations disrupt the gene, it could be your answer. How to read the variant, I think, is honestly the most relevant part of a lot of these. So we like to use gibberish. We call it the C dot, where it has a C and then a dot and then the variant. That is the letter change within a gene. P dot, they call it a protein change. Think of that as the word in the gene. So you're changing what word. And M dot is just mitochondrial DNA. I'll explain later why that has something totally different. But essentially, if you take this first variant, C dot 2224G to A means if you go 2,224 letters into the gene, you have an A where most people have a G. Like it's literally a spelling change. For the P dot, if you go 742 words into the gene, also known as amino acids, you have a threonine where most people have an alanine. It's literally a change from one amino acid to another, one word to another. So this is telling you exactly what is going on. And this is why I like the spelling variant metaphor, because it's literally a spelling change. Now, heterozygous just means you have two copies of the gene and one copy had the change, right? Hetero, different. You have two different versions of this gene. That's important when we're talking about autosomal dominant inheritance. It's also important because if that says homozygous, that means you actually have that same variant twice, one on each copy of your gene. And so suddenly that can turn a result I don't care about to a, re a result that I might care about. So those details matter. The inherited column is really just relevant if they have parental samples, right? So if we know this is from mom or from dad or a new change in the person for the first time, this patient hadn't had that done. So my first recommendation is going to be let's test parents and let's finish this table to get as much information as possible. The last one is what the lab called this, a variant of uncertain significance. It means they didn't have enough data to say yes or no that this could be the answer for this family, but they saw something, so they're letting us know. So we as clinicians can try to figure it out or at least keep track of it over time. Mitochondrial DNA is pretty similar. There's just a couple of little differences. This is an example from Blueprint. Essentially, the difference here is how they write things. So first, right, it's a mitochondrial DNA change. So you're gonna see the MT before the name of the gene, MT meaning mitochondrial DNA. For the M dot, it's the same logic. You go 3,243 letters in and you have a G where most people have an A. The difference here is because mitochondrial DNA is a loop, instead of doing how many letters into a gene, we do how many letters into the loop are you? So if I go 3,000 letters in, I'm like, oh, I'm in the gene. MTTL1, that's where the variant is. So they kind of all just back to back to back. And so they tend to have longer numbers and it helps for keeping track of where you are in it. So that's why we don't call it a C dot, just because it gets its own, whole own category. Level just means heteroplasmy. If you see a percentage on a mitochondrial DNA change, it's going to be the heteroplasmy. That's saying that 39% of the DNA that we looked at carried this change. I'll explain in a sec why that's so important, but that just goes with heteroplasmy. Remember, hetero equals different. So this means you've got two versions of your mitochondrial DNA at least, one version that has this change and one version that does not. If we'd seen that change in every copy we looked at, they would have written homoplasmic, homo meaning same. This is classified as pathogenic. And why this is an example I actually pulled from Blueprint's website is this is one of the most common mitochondrial DNA variants out there. So everyone uses it because it's a clear cut answer usually. It is commonly associated with MELOS, but can be associated with Lee syndrome, CPEO, MIDD, et cetera. But why this matters, all of these details, is because just carrying a variant doesn't always mean that that's your answer. So even for this one where it's pathogenic, we know it can cause problems. Studies have found that if you test just healthy people running around, most of the studies are in Europe, so I like to picture just a thousand people from England, you'll find that about one in 400 to one in 2,000 of them have this change on some level. One in 400 people do not have mito most likely due to this one change, they're a carrier of it. So then it becomes a question, well, what percentage do we see it in? It's one or 2%. 
even if you carry this and even if you have symptoms, it might not be your answer. But if it's in 20% or 40% of your cells that we test, maybe that is your answer. Part of, again, why they might test another sample. If your blood's a little low, but it's really high in your muscle and your muscle's having problems, that's a clue. It could be your answer. This is part of why it's so crucial to see a mito doc with some of these results. A doctor will see a change in mito and be like, you're good when maybe it's not your answer and we should really keep looking because maybe there's something else going on. Again, though, it gets hard because your blood could be different than your muscle. And so it does get a little confusing in trying to tease that out. And you have to decide how much digging do you want to do? Not everyone wants to do a muscle biopsy, right? Like you have to decide for yourself what matters and you have to know a doctor that knows this. With this, sometimes you'll notice that if it's a lower percentage, you see certain types of symptoms. If it's higher, you'll see different ones. So you need a doctor that can kind of tease that out and go, yeah, it's at a percentage that kind of matches what we're seeing for you. And so again, nothing is sadly clear cut in genetics. Now, I know that was a lot of info, part of why we didn't record it so people can really listen to it if they want to, but I'm hoping that it gave you at least some familiar terms or when you get your report one day or you pull yours out of your closet, you can go back and be like, okay, hold on, so wait, what does this word mean? And it can at least give you a jump start in understanding it. Though I still say it's good to talk to someone who's a genetic counselor just to have them really walk you through it and make sure we're not missing anything. And I'm gonna stop sharing now, that way people can actually see each other's faces. But in terms of questions, well, someone sent me one directly, so I'm not gonna read that one outline. I'll come back to that one later. Um, somebody wrote that they have mitochondrial heteroplasmy at the 99th percentile on my whole genome sequencing. Am I too expected for it to be causing some symptoms? So it can vary. One interesting thing that leads to confusion is, for example, if you have 100% of a variant in your mitochondrial DNA, for LHON, that is normal and it's causing your symptoms. But for other types of mito, sometimes it's honestly a clue that it's normal variation. Because if you had every single one of your DNA loops having a change, sometimes you're not having the symptoms they would expect or they'd expect you to have like passed away when you were really little or something like that. So sometimes a really high percentage can actually be kind of the opposite. If it's at 100%, that can sometimes mean well, yeah, you have it, and so does 100% of every female in your family. So if they're not having these symptoms or not having extreme enough symptoms, it might just be a red herring. So that's why you have to really correlate it well, or you have to know, is this a change that even can cause symptoms? If we're not sure about it, just because it's at a higher percentage doesn't mean it's more likely a certain result. It still might be a question mark at a high percentage. But I would say that on average, if you've got a change like the one I showed, and that's at 99%, yeah, you have mito, right? Like that, that's a clear cut. That's high enough that I'm, I'm worried that that's causing your symptoms without knowing the exact variant or without knowing how they tested for it or other people in your family. You can't know for sure. Clinical correlation, each person is going to be what's most important there, looking at your family and your unique structure and how it was inherited. But right, does that make sense? Like if everyone in your family has it at 100%, you're the only one that's having seizures or having muscle weakness or in a wheelchair, it could just be bad luck that things are piling on and tipping you over that threshold. But it also could be a clue that maybe there's a second thing that's really causing your problems. But in terms of other questions, one person was asking me more directly of kind of like, how do I figure out what my insurance will cover? How do I figure out where to go to see a doctor? Like, how do I know if there's new tests coming out soon? So I would say for those questions, there's a couple different answers there. First, how do you know what your insurance will cover? Not that insurance writes things in super great English that's helpful to read, but to be honest, most insurance company policies are available on Google. If you Google Blue Cross Blue Shield Regents of Oregon genetic testing policy, you'll usually find it. Like that's how we do it. Most of us are not pulling it out of some secret medical file somewhere. We're Googling it and pulling it off their website. Now, some of them aren't great about putting it out there. Some of them 
you do have to submit a prior authorization and see what they say back to you. But some of them, they have it clearly listed where they will say, we only do this testing for kids or for adults, or if you have XYZ symptom, or they'll say something like, we think whole exome sequencing is experimental, so we're never gonna cover it. Sometimes they are that blunt and it's kind of easy to know. In terms of where you should go in the last presentation, I did post some links of ways that you can find local genetics in your area or local mitral clinics. It's gonna really vary depending on what part of the US or the world that you're in. Knowing what tests are coming down the pike is honestly hard. Um, I would say that sometimes you can guess, like for example, whole genome sequencing was rolled out in Australia and in Europe more before it was rolled out here. So in the US, we're like, it's coming. We can see that they're starting to do it everywhere else. So it's gonna hit us soon. And so sometimes you can kind of figure it out that way. To be honest, a lot of labs don't tell you what they're gonna start offering till they start offering it. So even we get hit by genetic surprises a lot where labs like, suddenly we have this new shiny test. Do you wanna do it? And we're like, wait, where did that come from? And how does it work? And we have to kind of backtrack and figure it out on the fly. So. Sadly, they're not super communicative in terms of knowing what's coming. So when you're trying to figure out, should I do it now or should I wait? It can be hard. I would say as a rule of thumb, we'll always know more with time and things will probably always get cheaper with time. But again, it depends on how urgent are your symptoms? Is this something that's gonna change a treatment plan for you? Honestly, with Mito, sometimes having that diagnosis doesn't change what we do. For some conditions it does, but not for all of them. But it can get you access sometimes to clinical trials. So if you're wanting to do those, maybe you do want to do genetic testing. Or sometimes it can help with family planning. If you're planning on having kids and you want to know if you're going to pass it down, this would be the time to do it. So it really depends on the individuals and how they're feeling in that time in their life. If you're 18 years old and you're not planning on having any kids soon and you don't know if you want this on your plate, Depending on your health, we might be able to say, yeah, it's fine to wait a couple of years. Let's do this once you get to the point of family planning, and that way you have the most updated test at that time. You have to figure it out for yourself and kind of go back and forth. And depending on what's going on, we might have a different answer at a different time. And that's also the hard part, too, is someone could tell you, we've ruled it all out. And five years later, they're like, JK, we found your mistake, our bad. Um, here it is. And you can't predict what's coming. And so we don't always know what's coming down the pike, even from providers. Part of why I always say, never gonna say never. I'm never gonna tell you we've ruled anything out either. Cause there's always a chance we missed it cause we don't have the technology yet. Someone else asked that they have two nuclear DNA mutations and they have 13 mitochondrial benign mutations does 13 mutations on 37 genes. Is that a clue to reconsider the diagnosis, even if it's benign. So honestly, it's up for debate. So in genetics, the easiest answers are the yes or no, nuclear, one gene, have a mutation, causes symptoms, black or white kind of situation. That's the easiest for us to interpret, right? Because you either carry it or you don't. So it's really easy to look at 10,000 people and say, who carries it? Who doesn't? Do they have symptoms? Do they not? it's easier to figure it out. For mitochondrial DNA, it's a lot harder to figure it out because in each person, I might get a different result if I test you now than if I test you in five years from now. And so trying to correlate that to symptoms across big populations, it gets really hard to do. And so it doesn't have as clear cut of interpretation guidelines. And to be honest, it was only a couple of years ago that they even made the guidelines on how to interpret those. They were a solid, chunk of years after the other ones because they were harder to figure out. They put a lot of work into those. There are some recent papers that have come out that are trying to say that in some individuals, a combination of variants in their mitochondrial DNA as a group might be leading to their symptoms. But it's like one or two papers that are out there. It's really hard to figure out and to be honest with those papers and reading them, it's hard to know, was it really those five variants? Or was it that a lot of people who had those five variants are of this ethnic background that also has 
a different variant we weren't even looking at, kind of like that SNP testing. Were we just saying this is a version of the DNA that's more likely to have a different mutation and maybe that's your cause? So it's hard to know, is it a cause or a correlation at that point? Now, we do know, right, that if you've got multiple parts of your mitochondria that aren't working, the little thing that pumps the proteins back and forth isn't working, and then the part that builds it isn't working. I mean, of course, things can compound on each other, but it's hard to rule those in and out. I think if you give us, I don't want to set an unrealistic expectation, 20 years, <laughs> we might have fig figured it out better, but it really might take that long because it is hard to tell. And sometimes you have to do like mouse models. You have to do it in a dish and say, what if we had this one? Okay, now if we had this two, what if we had these three? Before you can really control it enough to try to guess for families. But on average, if you report out those benign variants, we all have 13. I've seen reports where most people have 30. So I would say on average, my answer is probably not your answer is buried in there. It's probably something else just because again, we all have 30 of those variants if you go and you report it out. So on average, it's not likely the answer for an individual. It still could be. Give us some time to figure it out though. <laughs> We're not that great at it yet. But the reality is we do know as we're learning more, sometimes different changes in different genes can compound, compound on each other. It's just really hard to prove. And so that could be part of why only the 20 to 40% of people have those answers. Someone else asked my daughter, years as a child, she's 25 now. Is there any update in testing for it? We're seeing a new genetic clinic this summer. We're trying to understand more. Yeah, it's a whole new ball game. <laughs> 25 years ago, they most likely only did mitochondrial DNA, maybe a couple extra things, but not too many. Now they will probably do a giant panel with like 900 plus genes or something like whole exome sequencing. They might start with some of the common variants that can cause it just to see if we hit any of those obvious top hitters. But most likely they're going to do a pretty broad net because we've figured out that like Lee's disease is not one syndrome. It's a bunch of different changes that all present similarly. And so it's not going to be the same answer for everyone with it. So we got to keep looking. Now I know we've run over. I tend to just keep answering questions, but if anyone has to bail, feel free to. Um, you're not being held captive by us. But um, in terms of other generic questions, Stephanie added in, you mentioned life insurance and sometimes you can't be covered. Can you speak more about that? Yeah, so it's called GINA, G-I-N-A is the law about it. Essentially our government passed a law that health insurance, so like the normal health insurance you get, cannot discriminate based on a genetic variant or genetic condition. It's called, that's why it's called GINA for Genetic Information Act. But they had some loopholes, life insurance, long-term disability, and the military. Those are not included. So it may or may not be relevant, right? If you're doing testing because you have a bunch of symptoms and let's say you already have cardiomyopathy or seizures, that might be enough for life insurance to be like, we're gonna charge you more. But particularly if you're testing someone who doesn't have a lot of symptoms yet or hasn't tried for life insurance, it's good to try and say, okay, how would this change anything? I've had patients who delay having testing by a month or two so they can get life insurance set up at a cheaper rate because once you have that diagnosis, it might move you into a different category. So I always say it's good to talk to like, if you have insurance through your employer, talk to HR, talk to the person and find out the plan that we use, what are their guidelines for how much they charge and figure that out ahead of time. Again, it's part of why we also don't like to test kids for things they're not gonna show symptoms of till they're older but why we don't want to test a 10 year old for an adult cancer syndrome. I don't want to then have them in a place where they can not be able to get life insurance and they didn't even have a say in it. And it's not going to change how we treat them at a young age. So it's part of why we're also careful in how we test kids. Um, someone else wrote, I'm getting tested to see if my other children need to be tested if I'm positive. It's up to your kids, um, depending on the change. So if we find that you, so for example, LHON, you carry the same mitochondrial variant in all copies of your DNA, all of your kids have it too. 
because they get their DNA, their mitochondrial DNA from their mom. So if it's in hundred percent of mom's loops, it's going to be in all the kids' loops. So that's maybe the one time I'm like, you don't have to test them. I kind of know your answer. For everyone else, let's say it's autosomal dominant. You have the change on one of the two copies of your gene. It's a 50-50 chance each of your kids carry it. So it's up to them to decide, do I want to get testing? Is this something that I'm having symptoms for? So I want to do it now. Is it something that I don't have symptoms for? So I might want to wait till the kids are older and they can decide for themselves, at least till they're teenagers. You have to feel that out. If it's autosomal recessive, where you as a parent have a change on both copies of your gene, on average, your kids won't be affected because you would have had to magically fall in love with a partner who also carries the same condition and also passed it down. But all of your kids would be what we call obligate carriers because both copies of your gene have a change. So you have to give it to each of your kids. So all of them would at least get one not working copy from their mom. And then it would depend on what copy they got from their dad if they're at risk of symptoms or not. So it really depends on what pops up where we start to talk about how do we figure this out. Um, someone asked, how do I find a genetic counselor to help make sense of my whole genome results? Depends on where you had it done. Um, you can find locally in the last presentation, I had links on how to find someone. You can do telehealth genetic counselors like what I do. If you're saying it has a lot of rare syndromes, my guess is it maybe wasn't a clinical lab. It was an online one. So then it becomes that discussion of how much do we believe these results? How helpful are they? What, how do we sort out what matters and what not? And some centers will see people for direct to consumer testing. We do see it though we try to say, pick your top three or four things that you're worried about because otherwise you could spend literally an entire week talking to someone about all their details. Um, but you have to just find out. And so like, for example, I see people for that stuff and my coworkers do, but the genetics clinic down the hallway from you or down the street, I guess might say, yeah, we, we have too many of those. We don't have time to spend 20 hours going through each person's. We can see you to order clinical testing, but we don't do direct to consumer. So you do have to feel it out, but they'll have it listed on, I mentioned the National Society of Genetic Counselors in my last presentation, NSGC, find a GC website. They have listed direct to consumer. So if that's what you did, they have that box you can check to see who actually sees that. Um, someone else said, should we get retested if it's been 18 years and we have new symptoms? If it was negative, yes. Um, if it was positive and it still explains your symptoms, you're probably good. But now if you had testing 18 years ago, there's a decent chance that if it was negative, then we weren't really even close to covering what we cover today. Um, and I see that a lot when I worked at a pregnancy center. A lot of patients would say I was diagnosed with this when I was three. Now I'm 23 and I'm pregnant. Can we do updated testing? And I'm like, oh yes, we definitely can. Let's see what we can find. Especially for something like Mito, where it's not one gene that's always the answer. For some things like Down syndrome, eh, if you were negative then, you're probably negative now because we know it's the one change. Or for things like Mito, where it's hundreds of genes and thousands of changes, that has definitely changed in the last 20 years. I think that's most of the big questions that were sort of applicable to different people out of the chat. I know we've run a little over, but if anyone has any other questions, feel free to speak up. Um, but those were really good questions and good practical ones. So I appreciate that. Um, let me look and see. I'm just really quickly screenshotting someone who asked me to email them because I can't actually save the chat always. So I want to make sure I grab that. Um, but yeah, and then it looks like Stephanie already shared, like this is how you can sign up to get the other presentation that's also on YouTube. This one will end up there eventually too. That also has my contact info on it too and where I work and stuff like that. And I'll be back next month for just random questions. So if you think of ones, you wrote them down this time, circle back and we can dive into a lot more details about anything you possibly want to know about. If I don't know the answer, I'll figure it out and try to get back to you. But Absolutely, as long as Devin. have the knowledge. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for taking extra time to answer all of these questions and the presentation. I love the fact that these first two were recorded for, because I do feel like I'm going to need to go it's back and reprocess it's, but it's so important and it's so great. And it's a great place to start. So I really, really appreciate you taking the time and putting all that together because it's, it's going to help this group. It's going to help 
people in the future. And, um, and just so you guys, you know, know, I put in my, in the chat, my email address, sharry at mitoaction.org. If you need to get in touch with, you know, Devin, or you have other questions, or there's ways Mito Action can help you with finding a geneticist, or, you know, you need support and you want to attend a support call, we can help get you connected in that way too. So don't hesitate to reach out and, um, but definitely look, look for this being posted at Mito Action's website. If you didn't get the last, didn't get to attend the last session, um, definitely go back and look at that. That's on our website on the YouTube channel as well. And, and definitely come next month because it's going to be exciting. Devin's going to have um, amazing things to share. You guys bring your questions and we'll continue to have some great conversations here. Yeah, no, thanks for coming, everyone. It's always nice to see a lot of friendly faces and an excuse to see everyone, which is also nice. So All right. Until next month, we look forward to seeing everyone. Take care. Good night, everyone.